Mm-hmm. All right, got that down I here. Wanted, I wanted to get that in, you know, not to plug it, but I am kind of excited. No, no, you're absolutely. I want you to plug it. I want you to plug it. We're going to have a whole other segment after this one for you to plug it again and all that. But I got a few questions I want to get. Well, let's do it. Let's let's get it. Let's get it out of the way. I do because I, one part I, I just want to just say a little bit about it is that. It, it centers around one day in the president's life. He's getting up, and, and he's going to give the, a speech for the United Nations to the largest audience in the world. There, it, it's Every form of media has been usurped, uh, from cell phones and smartphones and TV and every network. I mean, literally everything. They're figuring four billion people will be in on this, and he speaks before the United Nations. Uh, and he's going to, because the United States, of course, is now the leader and has to set the tone. And he actually ends up giving two speeches. One he gives uh, is is he comes clean. And he, it's basically what would happen if Ron Paul became president kind of thing. Uh, and then he comes back to his senses, and there's a second speech, which is the martial law, the drones for coming, curfew, worldwide control uh, here. Aren't you happy you got this uh, situation uh, and then there's the surprising twist at the end that I'm not going to give away. But that's, it. that's it. It is fun. It, it is a fun. It, 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 for anybody who thinks to know anything about politics will catch on to a whole bunch of what's in there. I, I tried to make sure it was very clear. Well, I look forward to seeing it when it's out there. I'll definitely look forward to it. Um, I have some, some more election perspectives I want to get from you. The House was held by the Republicans. The Senate was held by the Democrats. How will four more years of Obama do with such a partisan mixture in Congress? Well, now, you would think that it could come to loggerheads, uh, but the problem is they're all on the same team. It doesn't matter. They're just signed up in the, in, you know, in the, it's, it's a ballroom with two front doors. You know, one says Republican, one says Democrat. And as long as they can convince people that the only one, we're playing you know, with are in that room, then everybody else is peripheral. That's how this game of exclusion is played. But the idea that there could be any sense of loggerheads or any kind of log jam or you know, they're, they're holding them up, that's nonsense because literally every one of these people is on the same team. Well, do you it's think that... Show. Do you think that dictator Obama can rule by executive order, which he's trying to do? Will the House ever develop a backbone and strike down his efforts to legislate from the White House? I think they, I, they, they just might, because what we have here is not a concerted effort. Uh, the great thing about the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission and all and the CFR and all the Masons and the Illuminati and all these guys, is, and, and not only do they exist, I, I kind of think of them as just uh, overly funded fraternities. Uh, you know, they're just a bunch of idiots who just get along and think they can run the world. But they're competing with other bunch of idiots who are trying to do the same thing. So it's not a concerted one guy sits at the top effort. So in that sense, what we've got is a body of people who are controlled by the lobbyists. And you mentioned the Israeli lobby. I mean, they're huge. Um, they control it to pushed toward their direction, and everybody is there. there's a handful of them that are competing. You've got bad guys trying to compete with bad guys, and that's the saving grace for us, you yeah. know, is that they're not a concerted effort. It's kind of like the crime families being war on each other. Right. That's, yeah, very much so. Several states, including Colorado and Washington, have legalized marijuana for recreational use. The American Gestapo continues to disregard state laws concerning marijuana. Will we see a confrontation between federal totalitarianism and states' rights during these next four years? I would think we probably will not. Uh, they, they, in terms of a physical confrontation, because the risk the Fed runs is that they try to impose and assert themselves over the authority that they were given, which we all know they are, the Fifth Amendment is very clear, um, but they're overstepping, that that will be the one question that will be drawn into it if they do try to go against, say, Colorado and Washington. 
Um, and, and that's going to be interesting, but it's dangerous ground for them because if that gets into the public discourse where now we're discussing do the feds even have power here, well, the other states are listening too. And it could very well go against them. And I think that they're just too much a bunch of systems. They will avoid that conflict. They'll pick a little case here and a little case there, but not something that would motivate the masses to get up and say, all right, you're just done. You're fired. You know, that kind of thing. Do you think America will make war with Iran? No question about it. No, we're coming. We're coming. Uh, we want what they got, and it's not so much what America wants. America is the tool in all this. Uh, what, it, what it wants is they want a united Arab front in the Middle East to take over. And the Sauds are behind this. Uh, and, and you're going to love this one, the Saud and the Israelis. <laughs> oh, there. Talk about strange... This is so... Talk about strange bedfellows. Bedfellows. Absolutely. The, the whole point is to control the opium markets, which there's a, a never-ending market for, uh, medicinally and recreationally. But you've really got, uh, with Afghanistan, for instance, uh, it's leading right up there. You're in the same whole area... Uh, Iran controls some serious oil, and they want it. These are oil wars, and that's all they are. People are dying for oil, and we, we could be growing our oil. Up in Washington and Colorado, did you know that one uh, acre will supply the gasoline or the oil needs for an automobile, the average automobile, for a year, four of them for a year per acre? I didn't know the statistic, but I'm not surprised at all. I have a delicate question for you. It's delicate just because of the nature of the question, but it needs to be asked. Do you believe Barack Obama will be assassinated? You know, I hadn't really given it much thought. Um, I, I really don't know how to answer that. I, I don't know. I, because if he was going to be, all the reasons were there for all the crazy people, you know, the ones who would do it. Uh, they, he's already done. As, as, how much more do you have to do to push somebody to crazy people over the edge? Yeah, but I then there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people who say, well, we're going to get him out in the election, then find not. And there's also not just the crazy people, but I have sources, very good sources, that indicate that the global elite are very unhappy with Obama. When those people... Are, now, see, I would think he's... It, I would think the opposite. He's tool. You would think, but he has gone against their will. For example, he closed down the uh, um, the uh, oil pipeline in Canada directly against right. their instructions. I mean, he's done... The yeah, they're considering... The, uh, many of these people consider him to be a loose cannon. And, you know... Okay, that's fair. It, 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 it's why I ask the question, because it makes me start to wonder whether that's going to be what ends up happening with him. It could. I mean, certainly the time is as right as it's ever been, um, bar none. But who knows if something will do it. I mean, we live in a very docile society, you know, where people are, you know, they're, they're violent with their neighbors. But, man, when it comes to the state, they just, they would, they just cow. You know, they don't realize they're supposed to be your servant. Yeah, it is. It's it's pretty disgusting. See, now I say what you said is true for most of America. Be a little more specific down in Arizona. What are Arizonans like? Um, you're from there. Um, what do the Arizonans with whom you've spoken think of 2012 elections? Oh, I don't. I don't know of anybody who's actually happy. Uh, even the people who supported Obama because they didn't want Romney. Uh, there was a big, big. Uh, anti-Romney movement, and we've got a lot of Mormons, which was very curious, uh, and many Mormons were against him uh, because they, he, they felt that he kind of searched the religion's name, uh, and, and, you know, I don't care what, something, what they believe and, and all that stuff, I'm certainly no judge, but uh, when you put it out in front of yourself like that, and, and he tried to diminish it, that was interesting, but when you do that, I uh, Man, you just run those risks, and so Romney came out as as a bad guy, 
but we had people who just went to the default, and they said, oh, well, if he's bad, then the other guy must be good. Which, of course, as you said earlier, doesn't make any sense at all. What about the character of Arizonans? Do they tend to reflect what you said just a moment ago as, you know, what we're a fossil society and all that? I, no, I, Arizona, now we've got a lot of California to come in to start to really screw things up. But really, I think that the major progress we have made, because we, are, we have always been intent on education to just really get people thinking, because then good ideas filter into the society and they can't be undone. So we've always been into the education thing. And if anything, I think Arizona is ahead of most every state in the union that I know of, uh, is that there's a greater skepticism of government uh, here. Even amongst the people who move on, they're at least willing to say, yeah, they're a bunch of stooges. We're, that's where you can see the cultural shift and what's so different about Arizona. Uh, is that people are very, very skeptical of all politicians. Well, that, that, I, guess, I, I guess that's a good thing. I know, that, you know, one of your former state senators is one of my favorites, uh, Karen Johnson, who absolutely, you know, didn't pull any punches anywhere, anyhow, no right. way, you know, uh, and, and uh, um, you know, she's one of my favorite people out there. And uh, the only thing I, I'm sad about is that she's a former state senator, but I can't blame her for that. Either, um, but um, what do you, what do you think? I, I mean, talked with Karen last week. I, I, I mean, I know her very well, and you're right. She's a, a woman, a character. Yeah, exactly. You know, see, we have a problem. The, the people of character ended up leaving office. Uh, remember Helen Chenoweth from uh, I know Helen. Helen was magnificent. She was a great congressman. She even said, call me a congressman. That's the title. This garbage about congressperson or congresswoman. Um, and um, when she entered the House, she promised to serve for two terms. Because she was a woman of her word, she served for two terms. And then she left. So only the thugs and the liars and the pigs stay. What's wrong with this picture? I, you know, it, it, she's one of the people that we really didn't want to see go. And, exactly. and obviously, Ron is one of those. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the good ones. But I don't think he's going anywhere. Really? really? He's got enough of his, he's got enough credibility by himself that he's, I hope, to see him on the speaking tour. Uh, and so busy that he's never been busier. Yeah. Oh, that, 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 that I suspect will happen. I do. Um, you know, your former governor went on to become the director of the American Gestapo Department of Homeland Security Division. Now they're looking at her for attorney general. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Funny. That's not the I word. I was. Well, so I know. I know Janet Napolitano. I ran against her uh, very well, and actually, personally, she and I got along. It was our politics that were complete opposites. And that's probably why we could get along personally was because we know there was no sense in trying to proselytize the other. And I always tried, don't get me wrong. I got my digs in. Uh, and we talked probably many, many times. But she is another opportunist. Um, she sees an opportunity presented that will get Janet ahead and in whatever way she deems fit, and she's going to take it. If you have conversations with her, did you ever have conversations with her about how she views the people and her relationship to the well, people? That, yeah, that comes up uh, with all candidates. When you're in the green room and you're talking, you're just be, you know just before you go on to whether it's a debate or a TV show or something. Uh, and, and I think I, that she was no different than anybody else. And there is a lamenting of the lack of education in Society, the lack of appreciation for education. You know, the, the people who don't need a certificate, they just want to learn just so they know, you know, that internal curiosity. Uh, and, and they do, all candidates tend to diminish the public, and I'm just being very candid with you. I uh, in their backstage. You know, they, they, they do tend to say, yeah, we can get one to follow this, and yay, the rest will fall in. What do you see, now, considering this most recent election, how do you see it affecting the future for your state, for Arizona? 
Well, the same as it does any other state. I think all states now have an opportunity to stand up because, you know, the U.N. gun treaty, of course, went through moments afterwards and bombing Libya and, and sending uh, all kinds of drones all over the Mideast happened instantaneously with the uh, announced, as you said, and you, you're exactly right, because anybody who thinks that you can get 300 million people and be split 50-50 within less than 1%. Ah, come on, you're kidding yourself. I mean, you get 10 people in a room, and you, you see if you can get a 50% consensus, and then magnify the 300 million. It's a sham. The whole thing is a sham. So, again, you know, how do you think it's going to affect Arizona in particular? Well, I, I, that's what I meant. The same way it's going to affect any other state. I, I think Arizona is presented with the opportunity to stand up. Now, we did take sovereign rights over the national uh, federal federal lands uh, through amendment or initiative here on the ballot at one, where Arizona is going is uh, asserting its ownership of all land not lawfully ceded to the federal government, which of course includes half a million or three quarters of a million acres. Uh, that they've claimed of Arizona. The federal government has claimed 85%. That's a big issue out here. I think Arizona, I, I'm very, very optimistic that they will buck up, and we have fairly good access to our legislators uh, in the sense that we can, I hate to say it, but intimidate them by protesting or whatever, you know, uh, and, and find some nice, peaceful ways. There are some other ways that might be a little more controversial that, that we also have to employ, and we have to be ready to step up to the next level if that's what they, they force us to do. The American sheep have developed what I consider to be an incurable football mentality. If their state, their team, is pro-Democrat, right. then they vote Democrat. If their state is pro-Republican, they vote Republican. Never mind the candidates or their particular position. Americans don't think for themselves anymore. Do you believe the American sheeple have embarked on a downward spiral that will not end until they find themselves in the pit of totalitarian despotism, not unlike the German Nazi Third Reich, and then only at the cost of a tremendous number of lives? Well, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that's what it's going to come to, but I don't know if it's going to be as horrific as, as you might think, because remember, that Internet is a game changer uh, these days. It's, but as an example, I mean, we've got a Democrat governor here who ran in the Republican Party, uh, Jan Brewer, and the uh, funny thing is all the Republicans voted for her because of her registration, not because of her record. And it's, so it's a hysterical when you see that a lot of people are very, very tired uh, with all of this. And, man, I, I think here in Arizona, we've just got a leg up on every, every other state that I'm familiar with in the sense that it, I, I think you're going to see rebellion. This will, this will be one of the places that it starts. Here, Texas is probably Montana uh, and Wyoming, uh, in North Dakota. There are some states that are starting uh, – Groups are getting very, very active, and I'm sure that the government is very well aware of it. Well, when you say rebellion, I mean, how do you think rebellion will rear its head? How, how do you think it will show up? Are we talking civil disturbances in the streets? Are we talking riots? Are we talking militia activity? What do you think? I, I think that it'll, it'll probably go, the, the way that it normally goes, is you're going to have the all irate faction who will head to the street, protest, vandalize, loot, cause consternation, and start a bunch of fires just to keep the uh, infrastructure busy. Um, but by and large, the 80% in the middle will take a different tack, and they just won't participate. They'll, they'll just stop. You know, they'll stop paying attention to what government does, not in an arrogant way, but more in a cowardly way, where they'll just kind of went down and try not to be seen, and they'll withhold every fine and fee as long as they possibly can. And then you'll see it. It'll, it'll be more of an economic situation where everybody wants food is what I see coming, and they'll be more concerned about that than going to hunt down the bad guys or to, you know, start resurrecting the guillotine. 
When do you plan to release your book? Uh, immediately, as soon as we go through this last rewrite. All right, so by the end of next week. Fantastic. Um, now, I know the website, thepeacemonger.com, you said it's not up and running yet. Do you have a website out there about Barry Hess? People can go find out more information about you and the work you do? Uh, no, other than my Facebook page is about where I've concentrated my efforts. And I've got like 13 sites, but none of them have been updated in a year. So I don't want anybody going there yet. Okay. There are a few Barry Hess sites. Okay, but you, you will have the peacemonger.com up in the near future. Yes, I will. All right, so folks, that's what I, I can. that's what I want you to put down, folks. www.thepeacemonger, that's T-E-A-C-E, M-O-N-G-E-R, thepeacemonger.com, or go up on Facebook and look up Barry Hess, H-E-S-S, and you'll get him that way. <laughs> Barry, I want to thank you so much. You, for, uh, uh, let me say this, Brand, that if I don't get a call from the White House, or a secret service on the book, I'm going to be disappointed with myself. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good barometer for how you're doing for these things. Barry, thanks so much for spending this time with us and giving us your views on the aftermath of what some call an election. Really appreciate it and appreciate your perspective and your being out there because, frankly, there are fewer and fewer of us who are willing to tolerate it. You're out there, and that gives me hope, Brandon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Barry. God bless you and the work you are doing. Barry has www.thepeacemonger.com.